This video is sponsored by Into the AM, a really dope clothing brand who sent me this t-shirt. See the pinned comment for details. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the only show on the internet that thinks there just aren't enough genies in Dungeons & Dragons. I love genies just generally as mythical creatures, but I especially love them in the context of D&D. While there are a ton of great intelligent monsters in the game, like dragons for instance, I have always held a special place in my heart for the different genie races. I think this is because in addition to being aesthetically and thematically really interesting, they provide a dungeon master with lots of different tools for telling stories. Now I'm not suggesting we rename the game to Dungeons and Genies or anything, unless you guys think that's a good idea. But in an effort to see more genies in D&D, I have a very fascinating monster for you this week. As the vast majority of you are already likely aware, there are four primary genie races, and each one of those races corresponds to a different elemental plane. The Jinn and Afridi, which come from the planes of air and fire respectively, are probably the most well-known, even beyond the confines of D&D lore. But the Dao and Marid, who come from the planes of earth and water, are also pretty popular. I mean, all four of them are in the standard 5th edition monster manual. What's not as well-known is that there are at least four other elemental planes, and logically they should all have genies of their own. Right? I've already talked about the Kahail genies from the Shadowfell on this channel before, and those guys are pretty dang interesting. So as my next entry in the line of lesser known genies, today we're talking about the Karashi. As always, my goal is to go over the creature's lore, ecology, abilities, and of course some plot hooks and story ideas for how one of these ice genies might show up in your D&D game. Also, as always, I have converted this creature from 3rd edition into 5th edition D&D, and you can find that conversion linked in the description below. But for now, get your warmest jacket on, some mittens, and maybe even a thermos of something hot, because we are going to take a little trip to the elemental plane of ice. The Karashi made their debut in the third edition book, Frostburn. As the name suggests, this book was all about running D&D adventures in extremely cold environments. In addition to some survival rules, a variety of locations, and some character options written around the idea of frigid exploration, there are of course, a bunch of new monsters. So if you've ever wanted to run a D&D game set in Canada, this is the book for you. Just beware the fell geese. This isn't a joke. If you ever see one, do not fuck with it. There's nothing to be gained. Now, onto the topic at hand. The Karashi live on what is known as a para-elemental plane. Para-elemental planes are much smaller elemental planes that exist along the border of two primary elemental planes. Between the plane of water and earth, you've got the plane of mud, or ooze, depending on who you ask. Between earth and fire, you have the plane of magma. Liquid hot magma. Between fire and air is the plane of smoke. And between air and water is the plane of ice. These planes have all been updated in the 5th edition D&D cosmology to have more unique names. But the principle around their creation and what goes on there is entirely the same. These are all areas where two elements collide and clash, forming a brand new ecosystem, and I think that's pretty fascinating. Though there are all kinds of interesting creatures in these areas, as I mentioned, today we're going to the plane of ice. Keep your wits about you, and for God's sake, keep moving. Anything that stops might freeze that way. Remind me why we're going here again? The Plane of Ice, or the Frostfell, if you prefer, is an extremely unaccommodating place. Much like the coldest places on Earth, it's not somewhere you want to be unless you're prepared beyond your wildest dreams. And even then. But this, of course, is no problem for the Korashi, who are elemental beings of ice. Distant cousins of the Jinn, they have a few things in common, including a few of the spells on their list and some vague cultural overlap. 
Much like the Jinn, they build elaborate palaces and strongholds. However, instead of being constructed atop floating islands, their architecture is carved out of the elemental ice itself. And despite being from a plane that's jammed between air and water, the physical makeup of this place is actually quite similar to the elemental plane of Earth. Much like rock and soil, the ice acts as a solid building block for the plane's makeup, though it's a bit more slippery. And this, of course, allows the Karashi to build a wide variety of structures. And that, unfortunately, is all Frostburn really has to say about the Karashi. However, there is one more source of information on this creature that gives us a little bit more insight. Starting in 2001, Wizards of the Coast did a series of articles and mini-adventures called The Perilous Gateways. Each entry was about one of the many portals that could be found across Faerun and the history behind it. And in 2002, James Wyatt wrote a really fascinating entry in this series of articles and adventures that included some juicy details about the Karashi. So let's check it out! Unfortunately, the original entry and all other entries in this long-standing series is no longer being hosted online by Wizards of the Coast. But using the magic of the Wayback Machine, we can still access the page's information. No way. I'm getting hacked. No, this is major. I've, I've never seen code like this. What is that, video game? No, Tony, we're getting hacked. I'm in. Portals of the Frozen Waste tells the tale of the giants of Jotun. These giants lived during the Age of Giants when the big tall lads basically ruled the planet. In this story, the giants in question are the ancestors of creatures who would later come to be known as Frost Giants. In the context of this story, the Frost Giant Kingdom ruled all the cold places of the world and they did so in close collaboration with the Karashi. In fact, the Karashi are the ones responsible for teaching these giants the ways of frost magic. This imbued them with extreme resistance to their frozen environment and allowed them to achieve some level of success when it came to using magic fueled by the plane of ice. So in a way, the Karashi are directly responsible for the creation of frost giants as a species and I think that is a really interesting and obscure piece of D&D lore that I was not expecting to discover when I first started doing research for this video. But when we boiled this relationship down, basically, the Karashi Empire ruled the Plane of Ice from one side of the portal, and their frost giant buddies ruled a big chunk of the Material Plane from the other. And that basically sums up all of the canon lore we have for these guys, but Something I find really weird about all this is that at no point are their other elemental cousins, the Marid, mentioned in any capacity. It just seems so obvious to me that being a hybrid genie monster, this creature should borrow from both the cultures of the Jinn and the Marid, kind of combine and mix them together, and then build on top of that to create something new, right? So in my updated 5th edition version of this monster, I've included a few new additions to the stat block that I think will better reflect this. We're talking just some minor tweaks here, but it's probably easier if I just show you. In 3rd edition, the Karashi are sitting at a comfortable challenge rating of 6. And 6 is a perfectly acceptable challenge rating for a creature like this. If you're a goddamn coward. I turned the CR of the Karashi up to 11, and I did this for a few reasons. For one, every officially printed genie in 5th edition has a challenge rating of 11. So it just felt wrong to let them luxuriate in their badass genie powers while the Karashi is over here begging for a crumb of elemental magic. Secondly, by increasing the CR of the Karashi, it really allowed me to flesh out their abilities to a much higher degree and in my opinion make them much more compelling denizens to populate your world. Plus, if we use the hit die advancement from 3rd edition, all the numbers math out to be basically the same anyways, so sue me. Don't actually do that, I cannot afford a lawyer. The first thing I added was a weapon attack. All genies in 5th edition have a weapon attack that they use, and it felt very weird to me that the Karashi only has its fists to do battle with. But the real question here was, what weapon would a Karashi use? Jin are notorious for using scimitars, and the Marid are famous for using tridents. Because, you know, everyone who lives in water has to have a trident. 
So as a halfway point between those two weapons, I felt it only makes sense for the Karashi to use a glaive. That's basically a scimitar on a stick, and I don't know, I just think it's fitting and cool. I just think they're neat. But their slam attack wasn't burned off the sheet entirely. I mean, sure, the glaive might do more raw damage, but the Karashi needs to make physical contact with its enemy in order to take advantage of its most deadly weapon, Frostbite. If you are struck by a Karashi's fist, you might find yourself wondering why they didn't stab you with their badass cool sword on a stick. But that quickly becomes apparent when your limbs start to freeze off. See, when they strike you fist on face, you have to make a DC 16 constitution saving throw. If you fail, you become stricken with frostbite. In reality, frostbite is essentially a result of your body being so cold that it prioritizes pumping blood around your vital organs instead of out towards your limbs and extremities. This is why people who suffer from long periods of frostbite sometimes lose fingers, toes, or even entire limbs in the most extreme cases. In D&D, the best way I felt I could easily replicate this without getting over-encumbered by mechanics is to simply have the victim suffer a level of exhaustion. And if the frostbite isn't cured, every hour they have to make another saving throw. And if they fail, they gain another level of exhaustion. It's worth noting though, if they do succeed on the saving throw, they're not healed of the frostbite. The frostbite doesn't just go away. They simply manage to tough it out another hour without gaining another level of exhaustion. So make no mistake, if they don't get this magical frostbite taken care of, they're gonna die. Fortunately, it is as simple as casting a lesser restoration spell, but if there's no one around who can cast that spell, good luck, I guess. In terms of non-physical options in combat, the Karashi, like every other genie, has a bunch of spells at its disposal. All of the genie staples, like Summon Elemental and Gaseous Form, are here, of course. But it also has access to a few thematic and very powerful spells such as Ice Storm, Cone of Cold, and Major Image. They can also walk on any surface regardless of gravity if that surface is coated in ice. I won't lie, this ability seems so redundant to me given that as a genie they can, of course, fly. But I chose not to get rid of it and hang on to it anyways because I think it's a really neat thematic ability and there are a few extremely unlikely edge cases where this might actually come up and be helpful. As far as actually running combat with these frigid fellas, all the standard genie tactics apply. Using their flight to keep out of range and tossing out a few spells to soften up their targets while they do so is very standard for a genie of any kind. However, I do think that the Karashi might approach combat in a somewhat unique manner given the right circumstances. If the creature isn't backed into a corner and its goal is literally just to kill its target, I feel like the best way to do that would be to inflict frostbite on the enemy and just let that run its course. But if it doesn't have the option to run away, it would likely resort to the aforementioned hit and run tactics. But we all know that when it comes to a creature like the Karashi, the most interesting thing about it is how we can actually use it to build a narrative. So let's move on and explore a few. The one thing basically all genies have in common is their ability to grant wishes. I mean, technically only the noble genies can grant wishes to mortals, but it's one of, if not the first thing people think of when they hear the word genie. As lawful neutral entities, I don't think the Karashi would try to trick people into making a bad wish the same way that in a Freedy Mythe. I want to be the ruler of a foreign country, just as I've described it. <laughs> Go ahead, genie. Take over. As you wish, Mr. Castle. <laughs> I'm Hitler. I'm in a bunker. It's the end of the war. They're also not evil, so I don't imagine they would go out of their way to try and screw you over. But this doesn't mean they won't twist a wish to suit their own ends either if the opportunity presents itself. Though I do feel like a wish granted by a Karashi is going to have less ambiguity to it than a wish from basically any of the other genies. 
But this of course is going to vary from individual to individual. And if the wish does end up turning out bad down the road, I doubt the Karashi is going to feel too terribly awful about it. After all, the Karashi can be kind of cold. But aside from your standard genie plots, which I think work just as well here as they would for any other genie, I think there is some cool stuff to be explored with the Karashi. As para-elemental beings, they occupy a really unique space within the world's cosmology. If there's ever some kind of disagreement or escalating violence between the Jinn and the Marid kingdoms, I can think of no better diplomat here than a Korosh to try and barter peace. In fact, their icy disposition and lawful nature make them very well suited to act as impartial mediaries within the multiverse. Even beyond other genies, I could see a Korosh NPC acting as an important diplomat, traveling the plains, and employing their service to anyone who will pay. Something to keep in mind here is that genies are very powerful. Not just individually, but the kingdoms and unique abilities they command often demand respect. So the goals and obstacles they deal with on a daily basis are going to be so much more far-reaching than anything on the material plane, at least for the most part. Getting involved with genie politics means interacting with a world of devils, angels, archons, demons, gods, and everything in between. I mean, who knows? If the party ends up on trial in the Plane of Law, or even the Nine Hells, perhaps a Karashi lawyer is the best representation gold pieces can buy. If you do that, you're contractually obligated to name him Phoenix Ice. Objection! But for something a bit more grounded, I would look towards the last Prince of Jotun. In that online article, the Korash in question was an advisor to the Frost Giant King. However, as the Empire of Giants fell, he remained a mortal, and the last resident of the castle. That is a pretty compelling origin story, and I think it would make for a great encounter. Perhaps the party's investigating an ancient ruin, and they come across this ancient Karashi, the last remnant of an age gone by. They could be a great quest giver, an ally, or even a good fight if the party decides to get aggressive. Perhaps the party is even working for a patron of some kind, a scholar who has heard legends of this lone Karashi and sends the party out to go and find them in order to ask some questions. They might want to know about the Empire of Giants in that long lost age, and the Korosh in question might have the answers they seek. Speaking of patrons, with the Warlock Genie Pact option now at our disposal, maybe one of your players has made a pact with a Karashi. This could be a cool way to introduce one of the rarer genie races into your world, and might give the gang an excuse to go check out the Plane of Ice. If only we had rules for that though. Oh wait, we do, because I included rules for what kind of spells a Karashi patron might give you in the 5th edition conversion document. And if you scroll down a bit further, you'll see I also included rules for players who want to play as a Karashi-based Genasi. Or Genasi. I can never remember which is the right one. Genasi. Genasi. But if you've ever wanted to play a character with genie blood in your veins and a heart of ice, now you can. Speaking strictly on existing adventures that the Karashi might fit in with, anything that takes place in a frozen locale is obviously fair game. Rime of the Frost Maiden is probably the most obvious example of this. But even if you're running something that involves frost giants such as Storm King's Thunder, a Karashi NPC might be a cool addition to include. But if all else fails, you can of course just do some classic genie wish skullduggery to try and mess with your players. But you know what isn't a trick resulting from a poorly worded wish? The special offer from this week's sponsor. Into the AM is a clothing brand that specializes in graphic tees, much like the one I'm wearing right now. Their clothes are all super unique, and if you've been watching my videos for a while, you've definitely seen me wearing some of their stuff before. It's all very high quality, very comfortable, and right now, it's very on sale. They have a dope selection of graphic tees on sale for 25% off right now until February 20th. And if you use discount code DUNGEON at checkout, you get another 10% off in addition to the sale price. Into the AM also just normally allows you to bundle your t-shirts, so if you buy at least three of them, you're going to save even more money, which just further sweetens the deal when they have sales going on. And if graphic tees aren't your thing, they have a really sweet collection of basics too. Essentially, there's something for everyone. I genuinely do love their clothes, and I was already wearing a whole bunch of their stuff before they even reached out to me to do a partnership, so... I think that pretty much speaks for itself. So be sure to check the video description or the pinned comment down below for a link over to the Into the AM shop. 
And again, thank you so much Into the AM for bringing us here to talk about this wish-granting creature of cold. As always, there are 5th edition stats for this monster in the form of a Google document in the description down below as well. And over on the Patreon page, you can find the special patron stat block in the form of a high-res PDF. So if you like what I do here and you want to support the show, definitely check that out and you can get a flashier version of our monster stats. I'm super grateful to all the patrons who support this show. There seriously are not words to describe how much that means to me. And that brings us to our next segment, Patron of the Week. This week's randomly selected patron is Kakapo. Thank you so much for your support, Kakapo, and thank you for watching. If there's a monster from an old school RPG tabletop game that you would like to see show up on the channel, whether it's D&D or another system, let me know in the comments down below, or you can let me know on the monster suggestion channel in our Discord, the link to which is also down below in the description. And even if you don't have a monster suggestion, I'd still recommend checking out the Discord. We have a spectacular mod team, a thriving community, and all kinds of cool stuff is happening over there, literally as we speak. I also wouldn't be a proper YouTuber if I didn't mention I now have a second channel where basically I'm just uploading stuff that doesn't fit on the main channel. There's a few videos over there right now, but we can expect to see more things like extended cuts of interviews or extended cuts of bits that I wanted to fully mash into a video but couldn't justify spending the time doing so. Basically, it's the Dungeon Dad bonus features channel. So if you want to see more of this kind of content in bite-sized pieces, definitely check that out. But all that stuff aside, that's all I got for you today. So thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Till then. Dungeon Dad dives into the world of Pathfinder to find a massive creature of immense proportions. 30-foot humanoid warriors that fight with the power of fire and light. Though they seem to seek justice at first, there are whispers of corruption and blood sacrifice amid their kind. Next episode, Sun Giants. Tune in next time for lots more fan service.